Hey there, honey bunnies. Welcome to episode 69 of the Sovereign Storytellers podcast with your host, Michelle Wolf. Today's episode is, um, I don't know, something about food addiction. I'll think of some title (laughs) or it'll come to me as we're talking as it often does. So I'm breaking my no work Sunday rule because first of all, podcasting doesn't feel like work. And second of all, an issue came up in my weight loss class that I'm running, which starts again March 4th. It's called Weight Loss for Rebels. I'm playing with titles on that too. Today it's called Weight Loss for Rebels and it's on the website that michellewolf.com. Starts again March 4th. Anyway, whenever you are, I didn't feel like this could wait. So I am sitting down on the road because there's no power at my house right now. It's been out since um yesterday evening and isn't likely to be on again until later today if i'm lucky there's a lot of power outages anyway that that's irrelevant too <laughs> sorry let me focus i have had coffee <laughs> focus up michelle um anyway the issue came up and it's a sensitive one and i didn't feel like it could wait until Monday and I didn't feel like I wanted to write it out and it applies to anyone struggling with any addiction really but for today we're going to talk about food when you make a dedicated effort to end your addiction to food and apologies for any road noise I'm I'm way out in the country it's rare but I I, motorcycle just went by um you're going to run up against why it's a struggle for you in the first place, right? If you could have let go of food as a coping mechanism already, you would have, right? I mean, nobody wants to hurt themselves. This is where you know there's an addictive component to it because you eat to the point of misery, whether it's cumulative misery and you're overweight and your body hurts, Or it's in the moment misery because you eat too much food and then your stomach hurts. And it's not easy to quit doing that, right? If you hit yourself with a hammer, (laughs) it would hurt really bad and you wouldn't do it again. Because you're not addicted to hitting yourself with a hammer. (laughs) Right? Although some people do get addicted to the pain response. So we can get addicted to damn near anything because that's how our brains are wired. However, if you have eaten to the point of misery, your body hurts, your stomach hurts, and you're still eating, then you know you have addictive components. You might not be meet the clinical definition of an addict, but you have addictive components because otherwise when it hurts, you would quit doing it. Okay. Pretty basic. However, also our culture, uh, shoves a lot of shame on anyone who says they're struggling with an addiction, which is so unfair. It is so hypocritical for people who can't quit eating sugar to judge someone in the ditch who's in the ditch due to alcoholism or someone who's homeless because they're addicted to heroin. I'm sorry if you can't eat, quit eating sugar for two weeks without going through a nightmare of misery and turmoil, you're an addict too. Your addiction looks different and it might be less devastating. I would argue in some ways it's more devastating because it's socially sanctioned. So be careful when you're judging addicts. I, this is a soapbox issue and I'll try not to climb up on it. But um, so about the food. Here's what happens when food, often for women, their only source of pleasure and comfort and taking care of themselves is to eat. And generally that eating um, lands in some sort of high carbohydrate category because that's our brain loves that. You can also get addicted to cheese. It sounds funny, but it is true. Like people go through withdrawal when they give up dairy products because dairy products trigger an opioid like response in our brain. So we're like, I'll have a ham and morphine sandwich, please. (laughs) 
And then when you switch to like just a vegetable sandwich, you're like, wait, where's my slab of orange morphine? <laughs> Your brain doesn't like giving up cheese. Your brain really doesn't like giving up processed sugar. But the the devilish piece of it is it's not just the biological components, a little like smoking. It's not just the biology. It's not just changing the chemicals and making it 72 hours so that you're past the withdrawal. It's the emotional component. That's where we trip ourselves up. If your only source of comfort and me time is sugar related or food related, <sighs> And I'm asking you to give that up. Of course, you're going to be mad at me. <laughs> Some of the women in my class were honest enough to go. I was pissed all week. I was enraged. I was infuriated. Of course you are. Of course you are. You have staked your claim in one area of your life as this is mine and my family can't interfere with it and nobody can interfere with it. And God damn it, this space is mine and mine alone. But you're the one that staked the claim. You're the one that defined and I'll, and we, you, we, I'm using you in the global sense. More than one woman on the planet is struggling with this. More than one woman in my current class is struggling with this. We're the ones that defined the space. We're the ones that planted our flag in the sugar bowl, in the donut hole, and said, this is my space. Fuckers, you can't have it. It's mine, right? Because mothers get eaten alive. If we don't have good boundaries, we get eaten alive. And our culture says, you're supposed to let your family eat you alive. But it, you can't be. So you will stake a claim somewhere. And get a little piece of space that you define as belonging to you and you alone. Otherwise, you will lose your shit forever. And often that territory claiming is food. It's easy. It's there. It's addictive. It works temporarily. That's the trap of addiction, right? It works Kids smoke pot and it works. They feel better. And then they're stuck. Some of them, not all of them. People start drinking alcohol. And if they have the right genetic mix and the need for numbing, it works. We go back to what works. If you grew up in a sugar laden household and you learned that if you ate a ding dong or hostess, um, if you're in another country, you don't know what that is. It's like a little chocolate cake coated with like a waxy chocolate frosting, like kind of like a mix between a ganache and a fondant. They're disgusting. And they've got like chemical cream in the middle. They're really gross, but they're really effective. <laughs> Mine was pink snowballs, which is a cupcake with a layer of marshmallow over the top and artificial pink coconut over the top of that and disgusting chem chem chemical cream in the middle. My grandfather used to bring them to us. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so we're the ones that said, this is my space and you can't get in it. I'm going to eat the, whatever I want. Damn the consequences. And we feel better and we kill ourselves. That's the horrible irony of addiction. The thing that we're using to feel better only works for a few minutes and over time is taking years off our lives. If you went to your family and said, hey, family, I'm going to shave five to ten years off my life. Is that OK with you? <laughs> I hope that your family would be, what the fuck are you talking about? What do you mean you're going to shave five to ten years off your life? What do you what? What the what he what? But that's what we're doing. Our bodies will expire sooner because we are struggling with our health. This is not a moral issue. You are not a bad person. 
And we have to end that. And actually, the first two weeks of my program, we're just trying our best to start to become conscious of how we have applied such morality to food. Good food, bad food, good exercise. Good if you exercise, bad if you don't. Good if you stay on your restrictive, never can be successful diet. Bad if you don't, you know. It's like a horrible awful catch 22 where you cannot win you cannot win you can't be good or bad you're gonna lose every time and the third option is you got to step back and go oh my god i am insane i'm a liar i'm out of control get a little 12 steppy here and say you know i i admitted that i was powerless against my whatever the fuck I admitted I was powerless over my addiction or whatever and that I need help we won't give up an addiction if that's the only place we're finding comfort because we have we're human beings we have to have comfort we have to feel love and if we're not getting it anywhere else we're gonna get it in a bag of Doritos we're gonna get it in a box of cookies we're gonna eat it So what's the answer? First of all, getting honest with yourself that the only place you've allowed yourself to have yourself is wrapped up with a cupcake or some sort of food, whatever your bingy food is. That the only place you allow yourself to relax and take off the mask, stop thinking about other people, stop with all the emotional labor and the actual physical labor is when you're eating. First, you have to acknowledge that you have to acknowledge that it's become addictive. Like whether you want to call it a full blown addiction or not, doesn't matter to me, but it has addictive or you could call it compulsive. You eat even when you don't want to, you have opportunity. Somebody gave the example, such a brilliant example of being at a restaurant and having given herself permission to eat a particular food there that she didn't really want. But then the brain kicks in is like, well, yeah, but you should. You should. Because it's on the list and you can. And we're here and it's right there. So your brain will push you to act out the the cyclical behavior, right? The addictive cycle. A stressor happens. You resist it. You resist it. Tension rises, rises, rises. And then you act out a behavior. Tension drops and you feel bad. And you tell yourself you're never going to do that again. And then you hold steady like a honeymoon period. (laughs) And then you hold steady, hold steady. Life gets you, life gets you. Tension, 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 tension. Act out. You know, it's just that terrible cycle. But here's the thing. The tension's going to break either way. You're going to break it from acting out or you're going to break it by breathing, staying conscious, telling yourself why the hell you're putting yourself through this pain to begin with. And then the tension will fall. Cravings do fade. When you're caught up in addiction, you think the craving's going to go on forever and you're going to die. And so you might as well just eat the pink snowball and break the tension. The relief comes in the breaking of the tension. We can't handle that kind of tension. We have to break it. But we have options in how we break it. One keeps us addicted. The other one sets us free. You need a big, long list of why you're doing this, why you're giving up food, and what you're replacing it with. Often addicts fail to achieve sobriety for any length of time because they aren't putting the equivalent in its place. Tricky bit is you've got to train yourself to experience the equivalent behavior in the same way that you used to experience food. Going to the gym can be your me time. It is for my daughter. Now that the twins are older, she does take them with her sometimes because they'll play off in the corner by herself and she wants to model staying strong physically to them. I modeled that for her. I was 
overboard though with exercise and stuff but she saw that and she rejected it and now she's into it and she's like mad crossfit but that's her me time and she doesn't let anything get in the way of it if food is your me time and you're pissed as hell that somebody you know that you've got to give that up if you want something different you have to find something else you can carve out the time and make it just as inviolable as your eating time or your food or whatever. Whether that's going to the park or a greenhouse, if you're a plant person, if you like plants, or to the library, Barnes and Noble. You've got to look at all the things that bring you pleasure. And if there aren't any except sugar, then you've really got to dig deep and you might have to go out and experience some life and make a list of all the stores in your area and start going to them until you find something that grabs your interest. When you find something, and I'm just going to use the gym example. So you're trying to quit your addictive patterns with food. You want a different life. You want to feel good in your body. You're clear that it's not about when I lose weight, then I'm going to be hot shit and everybody's going to love me and all my life is going to function perfectly because we know that's a bunch of garbage, right? That's hogwash. It doesn't work. So if you're clear on that, that you're doing this because you don't want to hurt when you wake up in the morning, you want to spend as many years as possible as you can with your family you know, you want to get your eating under control and find peace with it because of reasons beyond thinking that it's going to fix your, you know, whatever, your money or <clears throat> make everything perfect because it won't, right? Life still happens, but you have to replace it. So let's say you decide, okay, um, I have to have me time. I've got to pick up my flag and find some new territory that I can stake a claim as mine, that my family doesn't get to come with me. <laughs> that my, this is just for me. You've got to get non-negotiable about it. So let's say it's going to the gym. And maybe going to the gym isn't the funnest place to go in the beginning because you're overweight. People are, can be mean. You might catch people looking at you and judging you. But that's happening anyway. It's happening wherever you go. If you're overweight, everyone knows what your addiction is. You can see it. You can't hide it. So that's, you know, cut that excuse off because that's going to happen wherever you go. And it will always happen. You could be thin and beautiful and people will still judge you. So you can just let go of that whole thing altogether. So you go to the gym and you're going to have to train yourself to love it. Working out when you're overweight and you've been out of shape for a long time is painful. You aren't going to get, generally speaking, you're not going to get the high after working out. You actually f sometimes feel worse. People don't understand that response, but it's well documented that some people actually feel terrible after exercise in the beginning. So you can't quit. You have to stay as dedicated to your time at the gym as you were dedicated to making sure you got your cupcake du jour. Okay, we put a lot of dedication and energy into making sure we have our favorite binge food um, and making sure that we get to eat it, right? There's a lot of dedication there. So you can transfer that. You have that power. And part of this is growing ourselves up and taking lots more responsibility and not making the excuses. So you train yourself to love the gym. You train yourself that none of my family gets to come with me to the gym. This is mine and mine alone. And if I have to hire a babysitter, then that's what I'll do. If I have kids who really can't be left unattended for an hour a day, then I hire someone to come and babysit them. I find a way. Don't tell me about expense either. Because fast food is expensive as fuck. 
so is desserty stuff. Unless you're going to like the hostess cupcake store and buying the day old things. Like eating badly is expensive. The health problems, the special shoes, the extra clothes, you know, plus size clothing costs more. You're spending that money anyway. So you can spend it at the gym and on a babysitter. Okay, you can. If you can't afford a gym, you can take a walk. There's a way. But your brain is going to say, no, there's not. I can't because. That's our rallying cry, right? That's our rallying cry to stay the same. I can't because blah, 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 blah. John Acuff is a brilliant and funny writer who's very relatable. And he talks a lot about like, he he gets so frustrated when people can tell you all about a series on Netflix in the same conversation complaining that they don't have time to work out or take care of themselves or um, read a book that's going to help their business or, you know, cook. We, we are masterful. I, I, we're hilarious. We're hilarious in our mastery of self-deception and rationalization. I call myself the queen of rationalization. If you need a rationalization for something, I can give you one. I'm very good at it. <laughs> I'd call it a superpower, except it generally is not that great. <laughs> We're so funny, right? So your brain is going to say, I can't because it costs too much. I don't have time. I can't, I can't, I can't. But you're not saying I can't eat this because it's going to cost me five years of my life. (laughs) Right? Okay. So you can't take away an addiction without replacing it with something. That is very true. Because it's mean, right? It's it's unfair and it's too much to ask of yourself to take away the only thing that's bringing you happiness. First of all, that's heartbreaking. Second of all, it's too much to ask. You won't be successful if you just try to take away the thing. People try to quit smoking all the time and they don't put something in its place. But that, uh, uh, smoking cigarettes is a multi-layered um addiction. So there's all the same with food. It's multi-layered. It's a comfort. It's time for yourself. It's a place that you allow yourself to just let your hair down and and eat the things. It's a physical, biological response. It's addictive and your brain is like, give me the sugar. Give me the sugar. I'm going to cut a bitch. (laughs) It's, It's fierce, right? It will fiercely fight for food. So you have to know that and you have to prepare for it. And the way we're handling it is with forest reiki, human design, and radical honesty in a structured week by week program over eight weeks. Again, you can find it at the website. The first few weeks are dealing with this addiction. Like what the hell am I going to replace this with? What in the world can I train myself to love as much as I love pizza? And that sounds impossible, but it's not. And I'll tell you why. As part of my weight loss journey over the last couple of years, when I first started intermittent fasting, um, I haven't always been. I used to be very athletic and I went five years without eating sugar. It's only been in the last 10 years that I've sort of let myself go and gotten out of shape. Like I've never been not strong. So it's been a real challenge in the last couple of years. I think May will be two years. I've been switching to intuitive eating and intermittent fasting and taking off the rules off, taking all the rules off of food is terrifying. I'll I'll grant you that. And also it's true that all the intuitive eating books and things that you read by Janine Roth and other people, it it really does change. You really won't eat 
cookies forever. You really will get sick of them. I'm now a person who can have a box of, or a, you know, a little container of Oreo cookies. Double stuff, of course. Don't be crazy. Um, <laughs> in the, in the cupboard and they, and, and they can go stale. Like they'll, they can be in there over a week. I never thought I would be a person who would have cookies in the house that would actually go stale. What I had to do to get there though, is I had to recognize that I was using sugar as safety, as comfort, um, as a way to feel okay. When I was growing up, we were super poor. There were times we were very, very poor. We would have been homeless if we didn't have a strong family safety net that picked us up. Um, there were brief times where we always had food, but it wasn't great food and it wasn't enough food. Uh, it was technically enough, but it, as a teenager, it didn't feel like enough. And I was switching it over to sugar even then because what my grandfather would do was he would like bring food to us. Um, and it was always bread because he would go to the hostess store. Hostess is a, a company in the U.S. that makes tons of pastries and, um, you know, every sugary food on the <laughs> that you can imagine pastry like Hostess makes. Um, so he would bring these boxes. He would go to the store and buy like the day old stuff, and it would be loaded with all the cupcakes and fruit pies and um, bread. I think I may have. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. The, a phone call came in. I don't know if you could hear that or not. Anyway, it would be loaded with all that stuff. And um, it would be like a shot of happiness. You know, things were a struggle. The one time that really sticks out in my head that I was conscious, even at 12 years old, I was in sixth grade. We didn't have water. We didn't have electricity. I don't think we even had a vehicle at the time. And food was scarce very scarce. And so when he would show up, it was like your birthday and Christmas all rolled into one. And then I would binge on the pink snowballs, which he knew was my favorite. So he'd bring a lot of them. <clears throat> and so then I equated, I was pairing up. It was happening way before that, but especially this time I remember, and then going forward, I was aware that I was pairing up happiness with a sugar in a, a big load of sugar. So when I started unwinding, when I quit sugar, I had to deal with that. Like, Oh, I don't, when I see sugar, I feel happy because it's equated. Now it's a conditioned response, right? You're miserable. You get a big load of carbohydrates. Your brain dumps a lot of happy juice in your head and it becomes conditioned. That's bad news and good news. The bad news is we're easily conditioned. The good news is we can easily condition ourselves to something else. We can transfer that over. When I quit eating sugar, I went through like a grieving process. I was sad about it. And I also didn't want to eat it anymore. And I had a bunch of big, strong whys. Sugar makes us crazy. Our emotional wild swinging and crankiness and random tears and stuff. It affects everybody differently. But for me and several women, I know when you quit eating sugar, it's like all of a sudden you wake up out of a fog and you're like, Oh my God, I've been crazy for 20 years, but I had to grieve it. And people giving up alcohol and heroin and cigarettes, it's important to grieve the loss of a friend air quote, it's become your buddy. It's become what you can count on. You can count on a cigarette to make you feel better if you're hooked on cigarettes. You can count on sugar to make you feel better. It does make you feel better. That's the truth. But other things can make you feel better too. And that's where you have to start poking holes in your, yesterday I was describing it as you've got, you're carrying around a bucket of concrete and it is solidified around this idea 
that I must have this or else I'm going to suffer and I don't want to suffer. So I'm going to eat. I'm going to eat what I want and fuck you. (laughs) Right. It's called weight loss for rebels for a reason, y'all. That's who I tend to work with. We don't like rules. We don't want to give it up. We don't want to change. It is infuriating. It's what you got to do. That's where you have to be a grown up. That's where you have to say, I want to live as long as I can. Yeah, I could get hit by a bus. (laughs) It could happen. But I have, I'm genetically loaded to live a long time. If I take care of myself even just a little, I want to maximize that. If you don't have a good strong why, it won't carry you through the transition of figuring out what else you can replace food with. I replaced sugar with um, knitting and crochet. I love to do those things, but then I, you know, was not really putting any effort into them and I was buying cheap yarn. So I let myself buy expensive yarn, beautiful yarn, beautiful wood hooks. I have beautiful wooden knitting needles that are handmade they're gorgeous um i started reading more this was years ago but this is what i'll do to to uh these are things that i still do to replace food um it was uh mountain biking i mountain biked for years and loved it it was walking more often around fort collins which is where i feel like Fort Collins is like my heart hometown. I'm from born and raised in Texas, but so, you know, the Fort Worth area is my actual hometown, but Fort Collins is like my heart hometown. I miss it a lot. (laughs) So, uh, what else would I do? I would go to the bookstore and I wouldn't necessarily buy anything. I would just go look at all the books. Just being around books makes me happy. So I'd go to the library. There was a couple of stores downtown that I really liked. I'd go sit downtown, weather permitting, and people watch. I think people watching is fascinating. Yes, I am a lurker (laughs) in public spaces. I am watching you. (laughs) Okay, you have to make a dedicated conscious effort to find what's going to replace it. And then you have to grieve the loss of what's easy and comfortable and feels like you're telling your best friend to go kick rocks. And it's painful. And I'm, I'm, I'm making light of it, but I also know that it is like down in the heart, painful, painful to change this. That's why we have to stop judging other people for their struggles with food. It is people are like, put down the fork. Well, I got something, I got a place you can put this fork, yeah, buddy. You can put the fork right here. <laughs> it is not that easy. It is emotionally complicated. It's it's not easy and it is easy. There is a way out that's easy. Following the road out, walking that road home is not so easy. And it's doable. And here's how I know it's doable. Because you are capable of enormous effort. You are so strong that you have held an addiction in place for decades that's actually killing you. It actually is hurting you. It's lying to you and making you feel that you're comforted and you're getting all this benefit from it. But it's a lie. Same with nicotine. Nicotine makes you feel like you're getting all these benefits, but it's a lie. It's not the truth. It's hurting you. It's killing you. And we're asleep to it because we're caught up in that lie. Too much refined sugar is killing us. It is making us crazy. It impacts mental health directly. The faster we can get a grip on this, the better our lives are going to be. The world needs our work and we can't deliver it as well if we are in pain. We won't last and have sustainable success if our bodies are struggling just to survive. 
And this weight loss group is not just for if you have a number weight problem, you're overweight. It's for compulsive eating. You can be thin and fit our cultural standard of beauty and have a real problem with food. I'm going to say if I say you need to give up sugar for three days and you freak out about it, then you'll benefit from weight loss for rebels, even though you don't technically need to lose weight. Why be a slave to food? So this is what I shared with the group yesterday. I took my rebellion and put it where it belongs. I got pissed at the diet industry. I got pissed at the food marketers. I got pissed at the media portrayals at women's magazines that say on one corner, 10 ways to love yourself. And on the other corner, best chocolate fudge recipe ever. And on the other corner, lose 10 pounds in 10 minutes. I started really seeing those things and really getting mad about them. I took what I had used to quit smoking and applied it over to sugar. And I did the same thing in, in, uh, with cigarettes. And I didn't think of this myself. I read like a zillion books on how to quit smoking. But cigarette ads show people and they're young and beer ads do the same thing. They're young. They're beautiful. They're playing volleyball. They don't show the end result of it. The, you know, if you show somebody sitting in a wheelchair with one of the rah, 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 things on their throat because their larynx is damaged and their voice vocal cords can't, don't work anymore and they have the thing you have to press on your throat to talk. Ain't no cigarette ad on the planet running that picture. Neither are the cupcake ads or the sugar ads. They're, they don't come with an addictive label. Surgeon General's warning, this cupcake may be dangerous to your health. And I'm not saying quit eating sugar. I'm saying eat all the sugar you want. Take the emotional component off of it. Take the good and bad label off of it. And what you're going to find is your body doesn't really want all that sugar. And you really can be around it and not eat it all. Oreo cookie example. I went through, sorry, I took, you know, took a long road, to, <laughs> took a long path away to come back to this. Um, so when I took the rules off food, I ate cheese quesadillas and nothing else for two months. Sometimes five or six big tortilla cheese quesadillas. It's all I wanted. And I was only going to eat what I wanted. And I only ate one meal a day because I was doing pretty strict intermittent fasting. So I was like, I'm eating whatever I want. I'm only eating once a day for an hour. I'm going to eat whatever the fuck I want or two an hour, two hours. So then it switched over to the Oreos and I ate a whole, not the family size, but the regular package size. I forget. I forget how many ounces it is. It's, it's a lot. It's three, three, uh, columns of Oreo cookies, double stuffed. I was eating the entire thing. I was eating some kind of protein because I was like, well, I ought to have some nutrition. <laughs> some kind of protein. And then I was eating the entire thing. The whole thing. The whole thing. Every day. I don't remember exactly how long, but it was a long time. It felt like a long time. It was weeks. And I was and my brain was losing her shit. What the, what are you doing? You're going to drop dead from sugar shock. You can't eat all those cookies. Oh my God. You're, you're not going to, they're going to carry you out of this house. The firemen are going to have to come. It's going to be terrible. <laughs> right. And I was like, um, yeah, I heard it. You don't fight with your mind because you'll always lose. You will always, always, always lose an argument with your head. So just don't even engage. So I heard it, blah, blah, blah. Or blah, 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 blah. Just ignored it, ate all the cookies, all of them. Then I started eating less. And what's weird is Oreo cookies were not my go-to food. It was ice cream. But for some reason, I hitched on the cookies. Um, and over time, it dropped off. And then there would be days where I did, they were on my allowed food for the day, which can be whatever food you want. And then I didn't want them, so I didn't eat them. I heard my brain do the thing. Well, you should eat them because you said you could and we might never have Oreos again and the world might blow up and what are we going to do? We'll never get another Oreo. You better eat it. 
Again, you just listen to the yay, yay, yay in the background and ignore it. Are you really going to let a voice in your head boss you around like that? Come on now. You wouldn't let a real person boss you around like that. Why are you going to let a voice in your head be the boss of you? If you want to play not the mama game, tell the voice in your head, you're not the boss of me. You're not my mama. You can't tell me what to do, voice in my head. (laughs) I'm not listening to you, me, you. (laughs) Right? It's crazy. We're crazy. Cray, cray. All right. And then it dropped off and it dropped off and it dropped off. And I don't always buy them. But when I buy them, if I eat them, I swear to God, I never thought this would happen. I eat maybe four or five. I don't put a limit on how much I can eat. If they're on the list, they're on the list. You make a list every day of what you're going to eat. You don't have to eat what's on the list, but you can't eat what's not on the list. It's tricky. Sign up for the course. I would love to work with you on it. Um, But so now they can go stale. They can be in there for a week. And by the time you get to the last ones, because I live in a high humidity area, they're gross. And so the dog gets them or I just throw them in the trash. I throw them in the trash. And if you don't have a food problem, that's like, okay, yeah, they're not good. Why wouldn't you throw them in the trash? But you have a problem with food. Throwing food away is like a huge ordeal. It's a big deal to throw it away. We'd rather eat it. In the midst of a food addiction, you'd rather eat the crappy food than throw it away. <clears throat> you'd rather treat your own stomach as a trash can than throw the food in the trash. That's how crazy it can get. All right. I haven't done this with food, but some people have thrown away food and then gone back later to get, get it back out of the trash and eat it. For real. I've done that with cigarettes. Throw the cigarettes in the trash go back the next day and get them back out of the trash and smoke them. Addiction is crazy. Addiction makes you do banana pants things. Just lunacy, crazy ass behavior that's hidden because there's so much shame wrapped around it, which guarantees it's going to stay hidden, which guarantees you're going to stay trapped. And personally, we need more light in this world. We need more loving people. We need more empaths, healthy empaths. We need more creative types. We need more artists, more musicians, more people spreading joy. And I want that to be you. I don't want you dying five or 10 years earlier than you should because a monster has you in a grip by your throat. Not okay. It's not okay. And if I came and asked your family members if they were okay with you shaving five or ten years off your life, I'm pretty sure they would say, oh, hell no. Oh, hell no. We are not okay with losing him or her. The group is open to anybody. Um, Losing him or her or them or they, whichever pronoun you use. Any even one moment sooner than we have to. Right? We can all think of people that we'd rather have back, but addiction took them away from us too soon. Let's not do that to our kids. Let's put ourselves first in ways that sustain our lives, that make it possible for us to deliver our work into the world that so desperately needs it so desperately are you needed in the world i can't even find the words for it explore these things there's tons of resources out there you can go read any book by janine roth G-E-N-E-E-N-R-O-T-H. I highly recommend Women, Food, and God. It's not like a religious book. It's excellent. Um, But any of her books are excellent. You can read Bear by Susan Hyatt. You can read... uh, If you just Google intuitive eating, you'll find a, a lot of stuff about it. 
if you you can read potatoes not prozac which is an excellent book that talks about the chemical things happening in your brain with processed sugar and how to handle the um the brain kind of let down that can happen when you stop eating a lot of refined sugar Okay, there's all kinds of things you can do for free. The other thing I'll recommend to you is Brooke Castillo's podcast called The Life Coach School. Her early episode, all of her episodes are good. The the ones lately are especially good. But if you're trying to get started on your weight loss journey and you don't have the money to invest with in a course right now, the course is $4.97 for eight weeks, plus a Facebook group, plus you get your Forest Reiki level one, and then and, uh, there's all kinds of bonuses, and go to the webpage. Um, but if you don't have the money to invest, or you don't want to, go listen to the Life Coach School, the early episodes on weight loss. And there's over, I think she's approaching 300 episodes. So there's like a shit ton of free resources out there for you. You don't have to live enslaved while fighting against your slavery, your enslaver of food. Isn't that funny? That's another funny thing we do. We are like, screw you. I'm not getting healthy. I'm going to defend my slave, my, the thing that has me enslaved and obedient to it. I'm going to defend the donut to the death. We are so crazy. All right. I love us all. So much love to you. Um, I hope that this was helpful to you. If you want support and guidance through a structured process, adding Forest Reiki to it is enormously life-changing. And you can't get that combination anywhere else. So Forest Reiki, human design, and radical honesty. Um, come and work with me. We'd love to have you in the next group, which starts March 4th. In the meantime, go check out the other free resources and just start thinking about it. You know, don't drop the hammer. Don't fall into diet mindset of like, I'm going to do this. I'm just going to jump in and I'm going to be different by Friday. Okay, that's diet mindset. Let's not do that to ourselves. It doesn't work anyway. All right, I'll talk to you later. Think less, feel more. Have a great day. Some whatever. (laughs) Okay, shutting up now. Bye.